Hey everyone, welcome back to Bio 370. I'm Eric Rothwell, the Thursday and Friday TA, and we're not doing Veer 2, which I know is a disappointment for everyone. It's actually rather fascinating. But since we're not doing that, we're going to combine the basic elements of what you need to know from Veer 2 without talking about Veer 2. And that's what the point of today's talk is going to be, which is dealing with PCR and RIFLIP or RFLP analysis. So in terms of the overview as to what you're going to see in this presentation, a little bit of review, we'll talk about PCR, we'll talk about restriction fragment length polymorphisms or RIFLIPs or RFLPs, and then we'll talk about applications to all of this stuff, some of which you might be aware of. So in terms of reviewing, when we did our restriction digest lab, we used restriction enzymes, and those can be endonucleases versus and or exonucleases. The difference is where they turn out to be chomping away at the um, phosphodiester linkage, so that bond between, between the nucleotides. And in order for them to work, we need to give them the right environment. That's typically done by giving them the appropriate buffer. And that's why in that lab you had some um, of your gels that turn out to be total digest and some that turn out to be partial digest. And that's because you didn't give them the correct environment. So what are those requirements? Of course, if you're going to run a restriction digestion, you need to make sure that you have the enzyme. Make sure you give the correct buffer. We need to make sure that you also add some DNA. And we usually put these to the same volume every single time. So we usually add water as is appropriate once you figure out how much enzyme you need to add, how much DNA you need to add, how much buffer you need to add, then we fill up the rest with water. And that's just a simple math calculation. These are some examples of restriction enzymes that we may or may not have used. The two at the top, ALU1 and HEI3, those turn out to produce what we call blunt ends because it's a direct shearing of the DNA, when we have the recognition site, which of course is a palindrome, we split it open nice and evenly and you get blunt ends that don't stick back together. The bottom three, the BAMH1, HIMD3, and ECOR1, those all produce what we would call sticky ends because we can recombine those together if we were to add ligase. But again, that's not part of restriction digestion. That would be if we were making recombinant DNA. So. The polymerase chain reaction is an in vitro process, meaning this is something that happens inside of test tubes. This is not something that you happen to see naturally occurring inside of cells, although it's based upon knowing that because we need to know how DNA replicates in order to for us to mimic what goes on and in order to get PCR to function. So in order to do that, when you make DNA replicate, what do you need? We need to have primers. In cells, in vivo, we would say you need to have an RNA primer, but in this case we're going to use DNA primers. We need to have the components so that we can build our new strands of DNA. Those are DNTPs, deoxyribonucleic, or deoxyribonucleotide triphosphates. So that would like be a DATP or a DTTP or a DCTP or a DGTP. So rather than just having one phosphate, we're going to have all three, and we're going to end up leaving off those last two, and that's the energy source so that we can actually replicate DNA. And we're obviously going to need some type of enzyme, which would be DNA polymerase. This would be what happens inside of cells naturally, an in vivo process. Here, obviously, because when we're looking at cells, we have to worry about lagging strands versus leading strands and the formation of Okazaki fragments and then removing those RNA primers. It's a big hoobala. So it turns out we can get around this in vitro where we don't need to worry about is it going to be a leading strand? Is it a lagging strand? Do we need to remove those RNA primers? None of that turns out to matter when we use PCR. So the reason why we would use PCR is we have a little bit of DNA and we want to amplify it. We want to make many, many, many copies of it. So there's some math. I apologize. But we can model this using this particular formula. So the number of pieces of DNA that we have at any given moment of time 
is equal to the starting number, n naught, times 2 to the power of, well, how many times have we replicated this thing? So, for example, if I start off with one piece of DNA and I want to make I want to make copies of it, and I want to run through this PCR cycle 30 times, I will end up with a billion copies of whatever this PCR process turns out to be. It results in a billion copies, which is, if you're not quite sure, amazing. So that's assuming that you only start off with one copy. If you start off with 100 million copies, we just multiply that number by 100 million, and it's amazing what we can do with PCR technology, so much so that it actually resulted in a Nobel Prize being given up. So the point of this is ultimately we actually form exponential growth. It will eventually run out or plateau, and that's only because we ran out of supplies. But as long as you keep giving it DNTPs, we can keep this sucker going for a very long time. Typically, you let it run for about two hours. So, when we run a PCR, we actually create what we know as a master mix, which is kind of like what you did when you did the restriction digestion. So we're gonna have a whole bunch of components that we mix together, and then we add that to our DNA. So what do we need inside of this master mix? Typically we need the enzyme, and we actually use one called TAC polymerase. TAC, T-A-Q, stands for Thermus aquaticus, which is actually a bacterium that was found in pool, in hot spring pools in Yellowstone National Park. Scientists had known about it for a while, but it took a scientist named Kerry Mollis who looked at it and said, wait a second, these things live inside of insanely hot water and they replicate, which means they have heat-stable DNA polymerases. Let's go fetch it. And that's what he did and ultimately came up with the idea of this in vitro process of PCR. We add our primers because we need to say, what do we want to replicate? We don't want to replicate everything. We only want to replicate part of it. And I'll give you a bit of analogy in a bit. So what we do is we use what we call a forward and a reverse primer. So I want to say out of all the DNA that exists inside of the cell that we have extracted, I want to say, I want you to start looking only at this one very particular spot and stop at this other very nitpicky particular spot. What that would be like would be like taking a book, so this one, just a book I have, and saying, I want to photocopy a sentence. I want to make copies of one sentence from this book. So what do you need to know if you wanted to do that? I would need to know what page to turn to, I would need to know what paragraph to find, and then I would need to know the sentence that is before the sentence I want to copy and the sentence after that I want to copy. It needs to be that picky when we make these primers. So it's not just an arbitrary, oh yeah, you just use whatever primers you want. You actually need to make these primers. And there's lots of programs online that help you do that. We need to make sure that we give the polymerase the right environment. After all, it is a protein. And then we need to add those parts so that we can replicate, the DNTPs, and then you add water to give yourself the appropriate volume, typically 20 microliters. Here's an example of one of those recipes. And again, it all depends on the concentration of your DNA, it depends on the concentration of your primers, it depends on the concentration of DNTPs, depends on the concentration of your buffer, that will dictate how this turns out to work. So several of us in labs don't necessarily follow this recipe and that's because our primers are at different concentrations or we have a different type of polymerase or what have you. Whenever we run PCR, always assume that you're gonna have issues with pipetting because there's just natural issues with pipetting. So we always add a one extra. So if I were trying to do this with 15 samples, if I'm, I'm going to run 15 samples of PCR, I would multiply all of these numbers by 16. And the reason why I multiply by 16 is I add a one sample oops factor just in case because I'm probably going to need it because the pipettes aren't working the way that we would like them to.
Polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, uses repeated cycles of heating and cooling to make many copies of a specific region of DNA. First, the temperature is raised to near boiling, causing the double-stranded DNA to separate or denature into single strands. When the temperature is decreased, short DNA sequences known as primers bind or anneal to complementary matches on the target DNA sequence. The primers bracket the target sequence to be copied. At a slightly higher temperature, the enzyme TAC polymerase, shown here in blue, binds to the primed sequences and adds nucleotides to extend the second strand. This completes the first cycle. In subsequent cycles, the process of denaturing, annealing, and extending are repeated to make additional DNA copies. After three cycles, the target sequence defined by the primers begins to accumulate. After 30 cycles, as many as a billion copies of the target sequence are produced from a single starting molecule. So, like I said, it resulted in a Nobel Prize, and you can actually find his name, Kerry Mullis, outside of the big lecture halls in the Hall of Science, you know, the next time you're allowed to be on campus. It involves three steps as implied by that video. The first thing is we need to denature the double-stranded DNA, meaning I'm going to take two strands and I'm going to break them apart, break the hydrogen bonds that are holding the two anti-parallel strands together. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to anneal the primers to the DNA, and that's also going to, somewhere in there, are, the TAC polymerase will bind, and then I'm going to activate the TAC polymerase by giving it, by heating it up to its optimum temperature, and then we'll make another strand of DNA, and then we just repeat this over and over and over. When it was done initially, it was actually done by hand in three different water baths, and then came along the idea of making a machine that would do this for you and change the temperatures for you. And we call that a thermocycler because it would cycle through all the temperatures. And uh, some people just call them PCR machines. But this is a schematic of what it would look like. We have our double-stranded DNA. We then denature it by heating it up. We anneal by adding those primers. We'll have the TAC polymerase bind, and then we'll heat it up so that we can start to extend and make two new copies of DNA repeat over and over and over again. So what would this look like? It depends on what you're trying to do. So different outcomes, depending on how long you're trying to replicate or if there's too much GC content or not that much, it changes this a little bit. But typically, we'll initially denature it for, at 94 Celsius for about 30 seconds. We'll have a whole bunch of cycles of denature anneal extend, usually for about 30 seconds each. And then we'll have a final extension just to make sure that, yeah, we finished everything that we needed to finish at the appropriate extending temperature. That's typically it. What could we do this for? We could do it to analyze human genome parts or any other parts for that matter, it could be for plants, like the VIR2 and Arabidopsis. So when we look at human DNA, just for us to be selfish, we turn out to have lots of components, and we have variation inside of that. We happen to have things that we call single nucleotide polymorphisms, where just for whatever reason, we have one nucleotide position that has options. We could have these random fragment length polymorphisms. We could have things called transposons and retrotransposons, present or not present. We could have repeats that could be short or they could be long and they could vary in terms of how many exist. All sorts of stuff go inside of our genome. Usually when we say that, oh yeah, very little of our genome turns out to be involved with producing proteins, the reason why is we have all this other stuff in there. What is it good for? Good question. Just because we don't know doesn't mean it's not useful. It's stuck around for a reason. So we could use these restriction fragment length polymorphisms to look at some of that variety. And we can use it for classification purposes, in fact.
So if these turn out to be our single nucleotide changes that turn out to be found inside of restriction sites, because these are specific for restriction sites. So how would we be able to identify that these things exist? Can you think of what you would need? Good list. Here's an example of how we can utilize this using sickle cell anemia, one of those genes that we told you you don't get to use for your paper. So inside of sickle cell anemia, or in the, the beta globin gene, we happen to have some spots where we would have restriction sites. If you happen to have sickle cell, one of those restriction sites is mutated and is no longer functional, meaning we can't chop it up using restriction digestion. So when we compare the DNA just of that gene, and then we take that DNA, so we'll polymerase, we'll use PCR to blow up, make a whole a billion copies of that beta globin gene, then we digest it using restriction enzymes, normal DNA, I should end up getting a cleaving point right here between the A and the B. With sickle cell, you don't. You actually get one band. What does that tell you? It tells you that you have a RIF flip, an RFLP. We had a restriction fragment length polymorphism, meaning when I chop up the DNA, the lengths turn out to be different. Restriction length, how long the pieces are, polymorphism they look different. Restriction enzymes recognize very specific sequences of nucleotides in DNA. DNAs from different individuals rarely have exactly the same array of restriction sites and distances between these sites. Therefore, the population is said to be polymorphic, having many forms for these restriction fragment patterns. These differences are referred to as restriction fragment length polymorphisms, RFLPs. Such differences may arise through mutations. By cutting a DNA sample with a particular restriction enzyme, DNA fragments of different length are obtained. These fragments are separated by gel electrophoresis. This provides a pattern of bands that is unique for the particular DNA being analyzed. These DNA fingerprints are used in forensic science during criminal investigations. RFLPs are also useful as markers to identify particular groups of people at risk for certain genetic disorders. So as pointed out, there's lots of applications for this. So we can use RIFLIPS in forensics, such as CODIS from last week. We can use it in medical diagnosis. It could be useful to figure out, you know, who's the father in paternity tests, but also in ancestry. We also use it in terms of evolutionary studies. This is one of the things that you can use in evolution in order to build phylogenetic trees and all sorts of other things. There's lots of applications of this. But that's not the only thing. PCR also happens to have lots of applications because there's more than one type. We can use sequencing. Sequencing is an application of PCR. We can utilize the amount of RNA or DNA present, and we call that real-time PCR. So we can quantify it. We can look at just RNA, and we call that reverse transcription PCR. So that's looking at RNA. So this would be just an example of what it would look like when we actually do sequencing. It's beyond what we need to talk about in here. This is actually an example of what it would look like if we were actually trying to do some sequencing, and this is actually called next generation sequencing. It's a different version, but still utilizes the same idea. On the left is an example that we saw earlier that turns out to be quantitative PCR, and on the right turns out to be what we would call reverse transcription PCR, where we look at RNA, not DNA. And in fact, this entire SARS thing, this phenomenon, the way that we do the diagnostic test is actually using reverse transcription PCR. And these are some examples from a company that's saying, hey, look, we'll sell you kits on testing for COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. And if you're curious, like, oh, I could just be making this up. Here's the document from the WHO, the World Health Organization, saying you want to test 
RNA using reverse transcription PCR.